sources of knowledge. Uh, there is another revision lecture on next Monday at the same time, at which I will say almost exactly the same things that I'm going to say tonight. So if you come to this session tonight, you do not have to come to the next session. Okay, it's going to be going over pretty much the same content. We have about an hour this evening. Um, I'm going to try and finish before that hour is up to give people time to ask any questions. Okay, any other questions after that you can always send to me by email. There's my email address on the slide here, gail.mcleod at ed.ac.uk. Okay, so what this session will cover, I'm going to talk a bit about the practicalities of how you submit your assignments. I'm going to go over some details of the assignment task. I'm going to talk about how your assignment is going to be assessed, the criteria that the markers will be using, and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the end of that if there's any things you still need to have explained. So, going straight into it, submission. There, all this information about the submission is in the course handbook, but as has become clear, not everybody is as familiar with the course handbook as I am. So, label your assignment in the following format. Okay, that's, that's the, the, how you save your file. You save it as one document. Your exam number, that's not the same as your UUN. Your exam number is not the number that starts with the letter S. S17, something for most of you. It's an exam number, and that's to help anonymize the marking. Okay, so your exam number usually starts with a B for some reason. It should be on your student card. Your workshop tutor's name, their surname is fine. So if you're in one of my workshops, just put McLeod. If you're one of Collins, put Broth. If you're um, in Andrews, it's Drybrush. So the surname of the tutor. And that's just so we can help make sure that your assignment is marked by the right person. And then sources of knowledge, so we make sure that you've submitted it for the right course. Okay? We don't want to be assessing things that you've written for a different course. It's important to get this right because this year what we're doing is we're making sure that it's going to be your workshop tutor who's marking your assignment. Okay? So that because you've been having conversations with that person for the last five weeks, so it's important that it's them that's marking your work. Okay? So your workshop tutor will be marking your assignment and this will help us track down any missing assignments. So you submit your assignment via Learn, turn it in on Learn. You've already had practice at doing that. Um, we, we give you a kind of a dummy run at submitting something. It's not any different, any more complicated than you do it um, this time. There is a declaration of own work form that goes with it. Um, and you won't be able to submit your assignment until you, you, you submit the de declaration of own work. You can submit your assignment up to a week before the deadline. The deadline, I think, is midday on the 10th of November. Is that right? So the drop box is going to be opened on the 3rd of November. Be careful, though, you can't submit, submit more than once in any 24-hour period. So some people like to submit in 20, uh, a, a draft assignment, see what the originality score on Turnitin turns up at, and then they want to submit a final one after that. If you submit your draft less than 24 hours before the deadline, you will not be able to submit a final assignment. The system won't let you do it, and it will be the assignment that is lodged against your name when the drop box closes that is the one that will be assessed. Um, so, the, yeah, the assignment and submission drop box will be visible from Friday, 3rd of November. Any technical difficulties with the assignment drop box, it's Marie Hamilton that you email, not me, because I'm not terribly good at that sort of thing. Um, so if you get in, in trouble, if you get stuck with that, email Marie. Hopefully it will all work quite smoothly. Okay, the word count for the assignment does not include references. Okay, now by that I mean it does not include the reference list at the end of the paper. It does, of course, include any citations you make in text or any direct quotes that you use. So when I say it doesn't include the references, it doesn't include that list of works that you've cited that comes at the end of your assignment. There's also a flexibility of plus or minus 10%. Try a name for the 2,000 words. Um, nothing terrible is going to happen if it's 1,800 or, or if it's 2,200. After that, people will start exercising judgment. And the judgment that people, use, academic staff, will normally exercise when they're marking something that's over length is... Is this over length because there's just so much really, really high quality stuff that the student wants to tell me, or is it over length because they're not writing succinctly? And usually it is the latter, okay? So you should be able to say everything that you need to say in 2,000 words. That's why the assignment's been set at a 2,000 word assignment. 
Right, deadlines for assignment Friday, 10th at 12 noon. The assessment feedback should be available by Monday, the 4th of December. Just want to say a wee bit about what happens in between you handing it in on the 10th of November and the 4th of December. Because that looks like ages, doesn't it? Except there's about 430 of you. Um, and our academic staff are still doing all sorts of other things like teaching their other courses and supervising the doctoral students and writing their articles and putting their grant applications in and all that sort of thing. And so this marking happens alongside other work. But also there's a period of, of standardisation before we can start marking where we all meet and we look at some assignments that have been handed in and we have a look at how we do apply the criteria and that's to try and make sure there's consistency of marking beforehand. And then after all the marking has been done, there's a moderation process where every person who's done some marking has examples of their marking passed to another member of the team who will say whether or not they think the marking is pretty much what they would have given. And in addition, I will be looking at examples of every tutor's marking so that you can be sure that if you get a 75 from me, it means the same as if you get a 75 from Claudia or a 75 from Roxy or 75 from someone else, Evangelia. Um, I'm going to feel really bad about tutors I don't mention now, sorry. Uh, okay, so, so that's what's going on in between that time. Monday the 4th of December is when we will aim to get it back to you for if somebody is off sick at that time and isn't able to do the marking or the moderation, I'll let you know and I'll let you know the revised date for the release of the marks. But at the moment, that's what we're planning on doing. And that's the full moderation process. Any marks that you receive after that are, of course, still subject to confirmation by the exam board. If uh, there are any late submissions or any requests for extensions, these will be handled with according to the university guidelines and there are notes on that in the postgraduate generic handbook. Extensions require an extension approval form. It can only be extension for up to seven days and late submissions will incur a penalty. Um, if you are submitting late because of special circumstances, then speak to your personal tutor about that. Okay. So that's the submission, the details of the practicalities of the submission. And as I say, all of that is in the handbook, okay? So none of that should be new to you. It should be fairly straightforward. But the assignment is asking you to write a 2,000 word review of one of the journal papers listed below. There are five journal articles which are in the handbook. The articles themselves are not there. The links to them are there. So the first task you're going to have to do is go and find the articles. Um, you need to log in through the university, through um, ease, and then you should be able to just get them through. I think all of them have the DOIs, just, the, um, uh, just put that into your search terms. You should be able to find it okay. If you can't find them that way, go to the journal homepage and search for them or search them using DiscoverEd. You need to give a balanced evaluation of the paper by highlighting both the strengths and limitations. More specifically, um, I'll go on more specifically in a minute. This, this phrasing, both the strengths and limitations, it was originally... Uh, both the strengths and weaknesses and then uh, one of our workshop tutors Malcolm pointed out that weaknesses isn't really a fair thing to ask you to identify because actually all this research has been accepted for publication in peer review journals and so there's probably not that well there's one that I've been reading I think mm, I think there's quite a few weaknesses there so I'll let you work out which one that is but generally speaking most published research peer reviewed research doesn't have lots and lots of weaknesses that is really easy to spot but it might have some limitations I might have limitations in terms of um, how many people they were able to find. You know, ideally, you want to do research with as many people as, as you can if you're wanting to do generalizable research. Maybe they weren't able to achieve the sample that they wanted. Maybe they didn't have the funding to do the kind of research they wanted to do. Maybe it would have been strengthened if they'd been able to include, say they're doing a study of students' experiences, then perhaps it would have been useful to have um, the, the tutor's perspective as well, but they've not been able to do that. So these are more limitations, okay? Things that they might have been able to do had they had more time or had they had more money or had they had more staff. All right, so don't worry about trying to find weaknesses in something that's, that's been published. But more specifically, with reference to the article, to the relevant literature, okay? So when I say the relevant literature here, more specifically with reference to the relevant literature, I mean the methodological literature. I mean literature about research methods and research design. I do not mean res uh, literature about canoeing down the spay or becoming a second language teacher or children in care and how they feel about their identity. Okay, these are the topics of some of the papers. The relevant literature is the methodological literature. Okay, so stuff like the stuff that's on the core reading list. Discuss the article in terms of, now there's four parts to the question and I'm going to look at each of them separately. So I'll just whiz through these just now. The appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purpose, 
confidence we can have in the knowledge, whether and if so what way potential impact is addressed, and then an ethics question. Okay, this is all in the handbook. This is what your research question is. Okay. So the first thing to say is answer all four of those. Okay, I've been looking at some of the formative tasks and part of the feedback I was giving back was make sure you answer the whole question. If you're asked to talk about four things, talk about four things. Okay, if you don't talk about them all, you cannot possibly do extremely well in this assignment. But spend more time on one and two. One and two are where the meat of this response should be, the main body of it. Okay, there's more to say about those things. A rough guide, and when I say rough guide, I mean rough guide. I don't mean exactly 700 words. I don't, you know, it's, you could plus or minus that, you know, by 100 words or so, but um, as long as you're using those words to good effect. But a rough guide would be to write about 700 words on the first point and the second point. So that's on the first point and set a different 700 words on the second point, not 700 words on points one and two together, and about 600 words on point three and four. Okay. But you're going to have to use some words. You'll notice that seven and seven and six does add up to 2,000, doesn't it? And we've not got introduction and conclusion in there. You should have an introduction and a conclusion. Okay? And your introduction is just saying, in this paper, I set out, you know, the, I you know, make a case for the strengths and limitations of this article. You just have to cite the article. You don't have to give lots of information about what the article does. Everybody who's marking will have read the article. And in addition, I've given them a crib sheet which summarizes the article for them. So everybody knows what the articles are about. You don't have to repeat the content of the article. And in the conclusion, don't introduce more information in the, con in the conclusion. The conclusion should just sum up what you've said. And a couple of sentences. In conclusion, in this essay, I have argued that. Just sum up what you've already said. Okay, we okay so far? Yeah, grand, okay. So this is the first one you're asked to do, the appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purpose of the research. It's not a terribly well-worded question, but anyway, let's have a look at what that means. So to identify the research approach, you're going to have to look at methodological, ontological, and epistemological positions, which by now you will all recognize as being the three things that go into a paradigm, yeah? Paradigmatic assumptions. Now, the paradigm is, it's actually really unlikely that this, there is one of the papers where it's, it's hinted at a lot more than others, but in most research articles, authors do not say, I am working in the post-positivist paradigm and my um, ontological position is this and my epistemological position is this. They don't say it. It's implicit. It's implied by what it is that they do in their research and the, the, the kinds of things they choose to research, the kinds of questions they choose to ask, and the ways in which they go about asking it. So do not expect to find a statement about the ontological or epistemological position of the author in the article. It won't be there. Okay, you'll spend hours looking and you won't find it. All right, you have to try and work out, you have to infer from what is there what you think their position might be. Okay, so it might be implicit, in, in one of them it probably is a bit more implicit. Okay, and then what you're asked to do then is assess the extent to which these positions, the ontological, epistemological, and methodological positions, are consistent with the purpose of the research. So, for example, if the purpose of the research was to test a hypothesis so that I could generate a universal law, it would be pretty odd for me to do a narrative inquiry. Yeah? Because that just doesn't fit. That's not what narrative inquiry is good for. Okay, there are some approaches to research which are really good for testing hypotheses. So ideally what you're going to get is a research, piece of research where the purpose is to test a hypothesis or to generalize, gen, um, generate a law or maybe to look for a causal relationship and the approach to research that's taken is going to fit nicely with that and is not going to be something like ethnography. Now, on the other hand, if I wanted to find out the, the meaning of a culture and the, and the, the culture and tradition and, and ways of being and those kind of unspoken, everyday, taken for granted ways of interacting between people, I'm unlikely to do a survey, right? It just isn't going to work. Yeah? So there's a connection between the purpose of the research, the assumptions that, that the writer is making about what's worth researching, what it's possible to know, um, what it means to say that we know something, and the, and the purpose there, okay? So when we're talking about these, these positions, methodological, ontological, and epistemological, I want to say a bit more about the methodological position, or the methodological approach that a writer takes, is often um, summed up as a research design, okay? 
So not all articles will talk about adopting a particular design, though. Some, art, some research would take what we might call a, a basic qualitative approach, where it's using methods which generate qualitative data. But lots and lots of research you'd be familiar with says, this study reports on a case study carried out, whatever, or an ethnography, or it's an experimental design, or there's a survey, okay? So the design is, is, is basically is answering a lot of the methodological issues that you're faced with when you're doing research. So if there is a clearly established research design, in the article, you will want to say what it is, and you will want to look at the literature on that design, and you will want to talk about what the strengths of that design are and what the limitations of that design are. What is case study research really good for? What kinds of research questions can it ask? What sorts of problems do you investigate through case study? Okay. Or if it's doing an experimental design, what's experimental design really good for? What kinds of things can it tell us? What kinds of things can't it tell us? Is experimental design really good for um, developing an understanding of how people experience something? Probably not, okay? Um, so so if, there is a, if there is an explicit design mentioned, talk about that and use the literature, the methodological literature to talk about that. Um, other methodological issues, I think almost all of the papers do actually say that they're taking a particular design. One of them maybe does, isn't so clear. Um, but kind of method, methodological issues would include what methods are being used and why. Okay, so when I say methods, I mean how is it that people go about generating or collecting the data? So a method would be an interview, an observation, um, taking a measurement of something, a direct observation, um, a questionnaire, focus group, that kind of thing. Participatory research activities, getting children to draw something, that sort of thing. So what methods are being used and why? So it's always this why bit. We don't just want to know what they're doing, we want to know why, and we want to know if that makes sense given the purpose of the research. How many participants are there? Is this a large scale piece of research or a small scale? How were they selected or how were they sampled? What kind of analysis is being carried out? Is it um, a content analysis, a statistical analysis? Are they looking for um, Probabilities, are they looking for significant effects or are they looking for thematic analysis to see what the broad themes are? And what's the role of the researcher? You'll remember in, um, when we were looking at paradigms, we talked about different paradigmatic assumptions about the role of the researcher. Is the researcher like that scientist that's, that wears the white coat in the laboratory and is kind of standing back and it doesn't actually matter who the scientist is, you're going to get the same results every time? Or is it that kind of empowering, critical research where you're working with a local community, maybe trying to help them discover um, ways in which they're multiply oppressed by capitalist male dominators? No, sorry, I'm off on one again. Um, okay, so what is the role of the researcher? How is the researcher connected to what it is that they're, that they're researching? Those are kind of methodological issues. And again, how well do these fit with the purpose of the research? Okay, because some of these are more appropriate for different purposes of research than others. Yeah. It's not really, you know, if you're doing an ethnography and you're a participant observer and you're living in the community and you're, you're taking part in it so that you, feel, you can feel what it's like to be a member of that community, that doesn't look like the scientist with the white coat who's very distant from the research. Yeah, you're an active participant in the research. So different purposes of research will have different um, uh, views about the, the appropriate role of the researcher. Okay. So this is it, the, the appropriateness of the research approach taken for the purposes of the research. So we've talked about the methodological approach, talked about the research design, we talked about what some of the other methodological issues might be. Then you're going to be thinking about what ontological and epistemological assumptions can you identify. Remember, these are not going to be stated. The ontological position of my paper is. Okay? When you've looked at the ontological and epistemological positions and thought about the methodology, you should be in a position then to make a pretty educated guess about if you went, if you met that person who wrote the paper at a conference or you met them in the street or Starbucks or something, you said, hey, I really enjoyed reading your paper. Now, it seems to me that you're coming at this from an interpretivist paradigm. Is that right? Okay, that's what we want you to do, to be able to try and figure out what kind of position they're coming from. Okay, now, you're not going to know for certain because you're not able to have a conversation with them and ask them about their position. So this is going to have to be an informed, you know, you're going to have to argue for why you think that. So don't just say, I think the paradigmatic assumptions um, underpinning this article are belong to interpretivism. You say, why do you think that? 
What is it about the way in which they've approached the research or the assumptions they're making about knowledge or the, the kinds of questions they're interested in asking or the relationship between the researcher and the research that makes you think it belongs in that paradigm? Okay, so don't just tell us what paradigm, tell us why you think it belongs there. So, so remember, an opinion is just when you say this is what I think, but an argument is when you say this is what I think and this is why. You give evidence behind your opinion, okay? That's what makes it into an argument, and it is arguments that we're looking for. I don't mean fights, right? We're not wanting fights, not arguments like that. Arguments as in pre um, presenting opinions which are backed up by evidence. Okay, so what might be an example of ontological and epistemological assumptions? Again, you're not going to find these stated in the article, but you might find them implicit. The first two are about reality, and so they are ontological assumptions. And the second two are about what can be known, and so they are epistemological assumptions. These are not the only possible epistemological and ontological assumptions. I just thought it might be helpful to give you examples of a couple so you see the kinds of thing I'm talking about. Okay, so if you're reading research and the research is talking all about reliability and the validity of measures and generalizability and the importance of getting a representative sample and wanting to test cause and effect and, and getting at the absolute truth and the independence of the, of the observer and all that kind of thing, then you're probably looking at somebody who thinks the truth can be known through the application of a scientific method. And that will belong either in positivism or post-positivism. If, however, you're, t you're reading something where it's talking about lots of people's different experiences, and rather than trying to get at the one true experience of being a child in care or a teacher, what, you're, what they're interested in doing is finding out the different kinds of experiences that people have, then you're likely looking at something where people believe that there are multiple truths, multiple realities, that everybody makes sense of reality in their own way, all knowledge is su subjective. Um, so those are kind of examples of the sorts of things to look out for that might clue you into the paradigmatic assumptions at work. So we're just on the first section still, remember, the first bit about the research approach. So your job in this first section, the first 700 words, once you've done your introduction, is to infer paradigmatic assumptions from the article. Okay, remember, they're not going to be there explicitly. And to evaluate the strength of the relationship between the approach taken, the purpose of the research, and the underlying assumptions. Now, do not be surprised if you find quite a nice fit between the paradigmatic assumptions that you found, the, the uh, methods applied, the research design, and the purpose. These are all peer-reviewed articles, okay? It would be quite surprising if there wasn't a neat fit. The fit's better in some than others, I would say, but it would be surprising if there wasn't a pretty good fit on most of the stuff that you're reading in peer-reviewed journals. So don't, don't kind of go looking for something that's a complete, oh my God, this is terrible, because it's not going to be there. Um, that's not why we've chosen these articles, okay? Um, so part of what you're writing might be saying why it is such a good fit, why it is that this approach that they've taken to answering their question is a really good approach for the purpose of their research. All right, so this, remember it's the strengths as well as the limitations. There might, there might be minimal limitations in some of these, okay? Um, you should use literature to support your argument. Remember the methodological literature. And remember to explain what key terms mean. So if you're using a word like validity, sorry, that'll be the next session. If, if you're using a word like ontology, you might want to offer a definition of ontology. If you find, you might want to draw on a couple of writers to offer a definition of ontology. You might find that different people use different words slightly differently, and you might want to say, well, so-and-so says this, but this other person said this. I prefer the first definition because, okay? So you're saying, you're, you're clearly setting out how you're using the language and which authors you're drawing on when you're using the language in that way. Okay, part two, the confidence we can have in the knowledge generated. Now, what this is about, you know, to what extent are the conclusions that the writers are coming to justified? How confident can we be in the findings? So, so there'll be a finding section of the article, every article you've got, pretty much. Um, or there'll be findings in there somewhere, because it's a report on empirical data. And the, the writers are trying to convince you. They're trying to say, look, this is what we found. So what this section is asking you to do is to say, well, can we have any confidence in what they say they found? Can we be sure that that is what they found? Okay, so 
The first step in this is going to follow on from the first section where you decide the most appropriate criteria to apply to the paper you've selected and say why and then apply the criteria. So if you remember, going back to week three, the lecture by Graham Gibbs and the reading by Merriam, and they were talking about it, these kinds of terms, validity, reliability, generalizability, authenticity. Now, you will remember that some of these terms were imported from the natural sciences into the social sciences. That some people, when we started doing social science and researching human beings and, and their beliefs and practices and things, that we could just do research exactly the same way as we do research in the laboratory, chemical or, or physical research. Okay? And so some people try to apply the same criteria for good quality research to um, social science research as they do to research the natural science, sciences. But other people have come along and said, look, it just doesn't work like that. It, it's a different kind of knowledge that we're generating. There aren't absolute objective facts out there that we just have to find the best measure, instrument to measure them by and make sure we use the measurement properly, and then we'll get to the truth. There are different views about what, you know, whether it's possible, what, whether there is one truth to get to. And so when people who are talking about social science research, many of them choose to use different criteria to assess the quality of that research. You maybe look at people like Guba and Lincoln, you'll look at things like trustworthiness, um, transferability rather than generalizability. So the first thing you need to do is work out which of these terms are you going to use to evaluate the research that you're reading. And don't pick terms which we know are used in positivist research, natural science, you know, lab experiments, to apply to research which is conducted in a completely different paradigm. That's the whole point of this course, is research should be judged, the quality of research should be judged according to the kind of research that the person is trying to do. Okay, we are not going to judge an ethnography according to how good an experiment it is. Right? And similarly, we're not going to judge an experiment according to how good an ethnography it is. There are different things we would look for because they're different kinds of things. It's like we're not going to say to an orange, you're not a very good apple. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It doesn't make sense. So an experiment is not an ethnography. So let's not hold them accountable to the same set of criteria. Okay? So if you're choosing something which is clearly interpretivist, and is clearly not looking to be generalizable, is not trying to look for cause and effect, that kind of thing, you are more likely to be looking at things like trustworthiness and authenticity, credibility, um, confirmability, dependability, these kinds of things. If you're looking at an experimental design, by all means look at validity and reliability and generalizability, because they are the appropriate criteria to evaluate that kind of research, okay? So decide the most appropriate criteria, and say why they're appropriate. Why, why do you think those are the appropriate criteria for this kind of research? And that should link neatly back to your first section about the underlying paradigmatic assumptions. Okay? And then apply the criteria. In applying the criteria, you're likely to have observations to make about specific aspects of the research design. Now, some of these we looked at earlier when we looked at um, methodology, about trying to work out, is the methodology a good fit? But here, remember, what you're particularly looking for is how do decisions the researchers made about these kinds of things, this is not an exhaustive list by the way, that's what this EG at the top means, it means for example, it doesn't mean everything you have to talk about is in this list, it means here are examples of some of the things you might talk about. So how does, for example, the control or lack of control affect how much confidence we can have in the findings from an experiment? How does the way in which an ethnographer has chosen the culture or the group to study um, affect what we can say about the knowledge that's generated there. So when you're looking at these issues here in this second section, it's about how do the decisions the writers have made about these kinds of questions affect the confidence that we can have. So you're still thinking about things like trustworthiness, credibility, authenticity, dependability, all that kind of thing. Okay? Right, the third section is whether and if so how is potential impact addressed in this article and the next bit of text after that comes straight from the handbook you don't need to take a photo of it honest it is in the handbook so we are not being asked what impact can the findings have that's not what you are being asked okay because you're not an expert in kayaking down the spay or well somebody might be experts in second language teaching but not everybody who does the article will be okay so you're not being asked to make uh, to assess the specific claims the author makes about impact because that would require you to know something about that area um, but you are being asked 
to appraise the extent to which impact and user engagement are or are not addressed in an article. So what do we mean by impact? So impact, remember, is the transferability of information that's generated in the university by research into a user community outside the university. How useful is that knowledge to non-university people? And importantly, what kind of research is it? Was the plan right from the start of this research to generate usable knowledge for a particular user group? Or was it more of that kind of blue skies theoretical stuff, the stuff that Einstein was doing on space-time relativity, yeah, and is now being used in GPS trackers? That wasn't Einstein's plan when he was doing that research. He had no idea of the applications of his research. It was blue skies, it was theoretical. Some research is like that, and I would say is perfectly valid and very important a kind of research. Um, pure maths it falls into that kind of category. It's not always easy to see what the direct impact would be. But a lot of research in, in sports and in education is applied research because it's talking to a direct practitioner community. It does have a clear impact. And more to the point, the researchers are wanting it to have an impact before they set out doing the project. Okay? So was it designed to have impact? If it wasn't, well, is that okay? You might want to say, well, what kind of research is it and is that okay? Why, why not? You, you can take your own position on that, whether you think it's useful for people to be doing research that doesn't have direct impact. Um, and it's okay to have a different view to me, as long as you back it up. But if the research is research that's been designed to have impact, and if there is an identifiable user group at the end of it, what steps have been taken to engage with those users? And could something else have been done? So if I'm doing research just now, and my, so my area is, is working with kids who are excluded from school because of behaviour issues, they have difficulty conforming to the expectations of the school organisation. So if I'm going to plan a new piece of research, what I might do actually is go and speak to a number of kids who've been excluded from school and ask them what kind of questions would they like me to investigate. The most recent piece of research I did is with family learning workers in Edinburgh. Um, family learning workers are, are, are adult education workers, professionals who work alongside schools working with the parents of children when they're just starting school to address issues of both family literacy but also the literacy of the young people. And we met with a group of them and said, what do you want to know? What would it be helpful for you to know? So they helped us design the, the interview schedules and all that so that when we've done the interviews, we've done the data and we report it back, there's a whole group of family learning workers who immediately think, well, this is relevant to me. Because these are the kinds of questions that I'm, I've been asking, and we know the way in which the data was generated. So I would say that that's a model of good research. It's quite new in the social sciences. There is some stuff on it in the European Union website, Horizon 2020. I think that was week three or four, I can't remember. Um, there's a link to the Horizon 2020 website anyway. So that's what that means when you're being asked to think about impact, okay? Is it the kind of research which has an end user group? And if so, how have they been included in the research? Or could they, could they have been more included? Okay, could they have done a better job of that? Whether the research is ethical, this is not just asking you whether or not the ethical codes and ethical procedures were followed. All right, that's one part of ethics. In my opinion, the least important part, the more important bit, is was the research ethical, was conducted in an ethical way? Were any ethical issues, um, any eth ethical issues arising that, that people, the researchers didn't think about beforehand? How have ethical issues been uh, dealt with? So questions like, you know, so people will say, well, yeah, everybody got a, an informed consent form and they all signed it and everybody volunteered to participate in the study. You think, yeah, but the person asking them was their boss. Right, so if the head of school, if Rowena Arshad comes to me and says, Gail, I'd like you to take part in an interview study about work satisfaction, I'm not really in a position to say no. Well, I would be with Rowena because Rowena is very fair. But in some situations, you're not. Some, if you're a teacher in a school and the head teacher says to a researcher, come in and research things, it could be really difficult for a teacher to say, actually, I don't want to take part in that. Okay? So even if somebody has signed a consent form and says, yes, I'm happy to take part, they might not have been <laughs> Okay, so that's what I mean, go behind the processes and the procedures and think about what ethical issues does this raise. Was anybody harmed? Was there a potential for anybody to be harmed by it? Was there any coercion going on, even if it, were, if it was just um, implicit rather than explicit? And is that something that the writers of the authors have written about? And if not, why not? Have they thought about it? Okay, and if there are ethical issues, have they been dealt with in an appropriate way? So that's the four parts of the question. I'm going to say a wee bit about different ways of responding. So, and I didn't, yeah, okay. So one thing 
is you could just give an opinion. You could say reliability is the most appropriate criteria to use to assess the quality of this research. Okay. That's descriptive. You're, you're stating a fact. You're just, that's your opinion, as far as when there's no reason given, no justification given for that. You might be right, but it's not a brilliant answer. It's an okay answer. If you give evidence for your opinion, so, for example, giving evidence might just be citing sources to, to back up your view. Following Spender 2013, I argue that reliability is the most appropriate criteria to use because this research is so clearly located in the positivist paradigm, where reliability is the appropriate measure. Okay? That would be a better response. Or you could critically evaluate. Now, you can't do this throughout for every point when you've only got 2,000 words, but you could say something like, there's some dispute in the literature regarding the most appropriate criteria. For example, Spender 2013 argues something, and Saver 2014 disagrees, arguing something else. I find Spender's view more persuasive because, now that's what we mean by critically engaging with the literature, okay? You're identifying where the literature disagrees on things and you're exercising your judgment to say which view you support. Okay? This is why when people write me, uh, email me and say, can you explain something, uh, my answer is often extremely unhelpful because the answer is no, I can't. Because there's not one straightforward answer. There's lots of different opinions. And actually it's your job to work out which of them you agree with. I might not know which ones I agree with, but that doesn't mean that's the same that you would agree with. We're allowed to disagree on things. The main thing is, when you put forward an opinion, say why, back it up. Okay? Um, so the, that's the, this is what you're aiming for, the critically evaluating. Right, when you're using literature, again, this is just stuff coming out of the formative feedback. Even if you're paraphrasing and not quoting directly, any work or ideas will not be, which are not attributed, you don't have the source, the reference for them, will be treated as academic misconduct. This is different from with the formative assignment. With the formative assignment, there is no issue of academic misconduct because it was not being sub, um, submitted for credit. Here, what you're doing is you're submitting work for credit, which means that if you submit somebody else's work, somebody else's ideas, then you would be getting the credit for their work. And that's why it becomes academic misconduct. There's a website there linked to avoiding academic, as well as good practices, about how to make sure you don't fall into the trap. Okay? If in doubt, put a citation in. All right? If you're quoting directly, make sure you put quotation marks around the direct quote. All right? Because that too, if you, if you quote directly, even if you put the source, if you haven't put quotation marks around it, if it, go, if it gets referred for academic misconduct, you would be penalized for academic misconduct. Now, I know this because I used to be the school academic misconduct officer. All right? So I do know that it does happen. We've had people have their marks reduced to zero for this. Because at postgraduate level, it's deemed, at postgraduate level, if you're referred, it automatically is deemed to be a major offence. It automatically goes to the college academic misconduct officer, who then investigates to see whether or not there's a case to be answered. You do get a chance to go along and defend yourself, but even if you say, look, I'm, I'm sorry, my goldfish died, um, and I was really sad, and I ran out of time, so I just copied it. Apologies to anybody who's very fond of the goldfish. Um, even if they say that, they'll still say, well, yeah, but you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, what you should have done is, is ask for an extra day, hand in special circumstances. Never, ever, ever try and pass off somebody else's work as your own. Okay? Um, avoid using too many direct quotes. There's a temptation, I think, to do, use lots of direct quotes. The suspicion from people reading that is usually that the reason you've directly quoted is because you don't really understand and you think they've written it very well and you think, well, I can't possibly put it any better than that. So if you are using a direct quote, make sure that you lead into it or you, you, there's some discussion around the quote to show your understanding. Otherwise, it does raise that suspicion that you've put it there because you don't really know what's going on, but it sounds good. Um, so, but don't use too many direct quotes. Right, feedback from the formative task, um, uh, plan your paper, okay, don't just start writing at the beginning and stop 2,000 words later. Think about what you're going to say and what points you're going to make under each section. Read widely. If you want to get more than a C for the criteria of use of the literature, you will need to read beyond the reading list. Define key concepts that you're using. Use paragraphs. Each paragraph should have a key topic sentence. It should only have one key point, and the key point should be very clear to the person who's reading it. Present an argument, don't just summarize or describe. So take a position where there's debate in the literature and then explain which you find most convincing. As I keep saying, an opinion is not an argument, use evidence, sources or reason, and use appropriate academic tone. 
Okay, no, first person is fine to say, I find this argument more convincing is absolutely fine. Not a problem with first person um, using I, but if you're talking about children, say children are young people, not kids. Yeah, something like that. So just try and keep the tone slightly more formal. Right, assessment criteria. I am not going to go through each of the grade-related bits of the assessment criteria because we would all die of boredom um, over the next half hour or so. Um, there are five assessment criteria. Full details of these assessment criteria and how they are assessed at each of the levels of A down to E, in fact A1, A2, A3 down to E, are now available in the assessment folder on the LEARN website. There's a grid that has these assessment criteria and then what an A looks like and what a B looks like. I'm going to run through some in a minute. Knowledge and understanding of concepts, knowledge and use of the literature, critical refractional theory and practice, constructing academic discourse and achievement of learning outcomes. We okay? It's a lot of chat about these. These shouldn't be any news to you because you've seen them all. This is what all your work is assessed on. These are the general postgraduate criteria, apart from the achievement of learning outcomes. What you will get when your mark is, when you're given your final mark, what we're doing for the first time this year is that we are dividing the marks up, the 100 marks up, and you're going to get marks out of 20 for knowledge and understanding of the concepts, out of 20 for knowledge and use of the literature, and so on. So that when you get your marks back, you will be able to see which of these performance criteria it is that you're doing really well in, and which ones you need to pay more attention in, in your next work. Okay? There's lots of chat over there. Is there a question? Or there will be to hopefully be time for questions if I speak very quickly over the next bit. Okay. Um, the one thing, remember, yeah, is that University of Edinburgh, 50 to 59% is good. People get really upset when they get a mark of 55. They go, oh, no, it's terrible. It's good, <laughs> right? Really, it's good. When I was a PhD student here, I used to be getting 58s and 59s all the time, right? And I was allowed in to do a PhD, so it's a good mark. Hardly anybody gets over 70%. I don't think I ever, yeah, I know, I think I did in one essay, I think I got over 70% in the whole time. And I've done three postgraduate degrees, yeah? So do not expect to get over 70. And I'm not stupid. I'm not brilliant, obviously, but I'm not stupid, okay? So, so don't worry about your marks. I would think most people get somewhere around the C mark, okay? If you get into the Bs, you're doing really, really well. Okay? Okay. Right. Guys, I'm going to wait till everybody's quiet again. We're going to run out of time, and that's because I've, I've got somewhere else to be, as I say, at 6 o'clock, and I do want time for questions if we can. These are the learning outcomes, they are in the course handbook. Okay, hopefully now you look back at them, you can see where we've been going with some of the workshop activities. Okay, current debates about, you know, social science research, what's it like, what's the point of it, strengths and weaknesses of different paradigms, skills in the analysis, evaluation, interpretation of specific forms of social science research writing. So all of you will have had practice at critiquing either case study or survey or experimental design. That's what you were doing in, in weeks three and four. And consider the issues of reliability, validity, generalizability, and trustworthiness. Trustworthy there is, there is being used as a kind of catch-all for all the kind of authenticity, credibility, dependability, all that stuff. Right. So what we've got next, the next five slides. Knowledge and understanding of the concepts is one of the assessment criteria. That is what it says to get an A. You've understood the main concepts and theories dealt with in the course without any misunderstanding. No misunderstanding at all anywhere in your 2,000 words. Good luck and you've been able to integrate this into a coherent framework. Okay, so not only do you have to do it showing total understanding, but you have to do it coherently as well. It has to be really smooth flowing and make a lot of sense and be all in the right order. B, maybe a bit more realistic. You've understood the main concepts and theories. That's good. Dealt with in the course without any mistakes. Still not allowed any misunderstanding. Okay, because that'd be very good to get this. The theories and concepts dealt with in the assignment reflect a major concept part of the course. So you might be able to miss out one or two things. You demonstrate understanding of them, although there is some misunderstanding, okay? So you're allowed to not quite get epistemology, sort of. No, nah, you should get epistemology, but you're not allowed to not quite get some of the stuff, okay? And you can get C. 
This, we're on to a D here. Some omissions or misunderstandings in your handling of the theories. And it is not at all unusual to get a D in this first assignment. It's the first time you've been writing at master's level. Um, well, most of you will be the first time you've been writing at master's level. For a lot of you, it's the first time you've been writing at master's level in a British university with British academic cultures. For a lot of the rest of you, it's coming back to doing this kind of study after a long, long time away. Okay? People will often get quite a poor mark in sources of knowledge and go, in fact, one of my, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but one of my current students um, who happens to be a tutor on this course, when he first started doing his MSc here a few years ago, he got 32% in one of his early courses and he got an A in his dissertation. Okay? So it's possible to, and, and is now doing a PhD. Okay, this is an E. Little or no evidence of understanding the theories and concepts or the theories and concepts are handled in a way that shows considerable misunderstanding. Right. Okay, guys, I want to say a bit about critical engagement. Um, as I say, a full set of the grade-related criteria that your work will be assessed against will be found in the assessment folder or learn. It's there now. I put it up there earlier today. Um, one of the words that keeps coming up is critical. Yeah? Sorry, I'm trying to break this. Um, critical engagement. Being critical means taking nothing for granted. It means questioning. It means applying reason. It does not simply mean criticizing. Okay? That's not what it means to be critically engaged. So, what does it mean? I want to talk to you very, very... How many of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Some of you do the learners, learners. Somebody over there. One person knows Bloom's taxonomy. Excellent. Two people. Yes, get in. Right, you know what you're doing then. Okay, so Bloom was a guy writing in the 50s or 60s-ish, don't know, um, wrote about different ways of categorizing the way in which we think. He said there was a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is evaluation. And these are the things that build up to it. So knowledge is just where you can repeat what somebody said. You remember stuff. You know what the capital of France is. Comprehension is where you understand something. Okay, so it's being able to, um, yeah, to be, make sense of something, maybe to compare things, that sort of thing. Application is where you can apply knowledge to problems, new problems. Analysis, breaking it into parts, making inferences, finding evidence. You see how it's getting more complicated? Yeah. Synthesis, putting things back together again, but in a new way. And evaluation, presenting and defending opinions, making judgments and using criteria. Now, you'll be doing a bit of all of this in your assignments, but I think the ones that you'll be focusing on will be comprehension, analysis, and evaluation. There's going to be knowledge in there as well for sure, but actually we're wanting understanding as well as knowledge. So the questions here, the kinds of questions that, that, that elicit um, answers which demonstrate understanding. What statement supports the view? What's the main idea of? Can you explain what's happening? These are kind of comprehension types questions. And the kind of verbs that go along with comprehension are comparing, contrasting, explaining, outlining, paraphrasing. That's why it's very difficult to paraphrase what somebody else has said unless you understand it. So being able to paraphrase is a demonstration of, of comprehension. Summarizing and illustrating. These are comprehension type things. So that's the sorts of things you're going to be engaged with. But remember, comprehension is just level two. That's fairly basic kind of cognitive skill. Analysis is further up the pyramid. So the kinds of questions which require an analytical response would be, what are the parts of something? What are the features of something? What are the features of a case study design? What inference can you make from the kind of research they've designed about what knowledge they think is possible? What is the relationship between the methodological approach taken and the purpose of the research? Okay, these are questions which are asking for an analytical response. Categorizing, classifying, discovering, distinguish, distinguishing, simplifying relationships and inference. Remember when I went back to the beginning and I said that the first part of the section, you're being asked to infer inference as a skill of analysis. And the final one I want to talk about is evaluation. Where you're, and again, evaluation questions would be questions where you're asked to make a judgment about something. You're passing your opinion. How would you compare these two ideas? How would you compare what this person says about positivism with what this person says? Okay, there's lots of debates in literature about to what extent there is actually a big divide between positivism and interpretivist research. The Richard Pring's paper on the false dualism of educational research is a good one to look at. Might be in the philosophy course, is it? Who's doing MSc education and philosophy? Is, have you read Richard Pring? Have you been told to? Nah, you will. James will make you read it eventually. Um, based on what you know, how would you explain something? Why was one thing better than another? Okay, and the kind of verbs you might think of here are evaluating, judging, justifying, rating something, assessing something, and interpreting. 
So that's what you're aiming for. That's what we mean by higher order thinking skills. It's this evaluation and analysis based on a sound knowledge and comprehension. So I've talked about submission, the assignment and the assessment criteria. Uh, to remind you that the full grade related criteria are learn, familiarise yourself with them so you know what you're aiming for. When you get your feedback back, you'll just get a letter in the box. It will say knowledge and use of the literature, B or C or A or A1. Okay? Your job is to take that letter and map it onto the grid and see what that means. And that's because it's not a good use of my tutor's time to be cutting and pasting out exactly the same words 450 times. Reflect on your formative feedback. Okay, formative feedback, not just for this course, but for other courses. The whole point of formative feedback is it should be useful for lots of different courses. So think about that first when you start working on your assignment. Okay, I'm going to, has anybody got any questions? We have a, a microphone here, apparently. But while I'm, right, shout into the microphone. So, because the mic isn't working very well, I missed the first part of that question. So you're, you're saying, are there, if there's different methodologies in the same paper, or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, not interested in that. Not interested in other research on the same topic. You're interested in how well they've done that research. No, no, no. So if you're, if you're evaluating the articles about kayaking down the spay, do not go and look at other articles about kayaking down the spay to see how they've done it. That's not what you're doing. You're looking at the one article and the other literature you should be looking at is the methodological literature about, about the methodology that they have chosen to use, not what somebody else might have done. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah. Can we chuck this? <laughs> Let me chuck them. You chuck it back to me. And I get to throw things, right. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you have a special title? I don't care what you call it. I'm not, you're not going to get marks for the title. No. Okay, anything else? Yeah, sorry, back to the front. Do you want to chuck? You chuck it this time. All right. Uh, any recommendations for the further reading? Um, there are some, if you look on this course handbook, there are, there are some, some extended reading. Each week there's been extended readings. The Howells book on philosophy of education research is good if that's what you're interested in. But it will depend on what paper you choose, because it will depend on the, on the research design that they've taken and the, the um, uh, paradigmatic assumptions that they're making. Um, Gary Thomas on case study research is good if you're doing case study. Robert Stake is good, Robert Yin, Michael Bassey. Um, Research methods textbooks will cover most things. If you're doing case study, look at Bent Flyberg's work on in defensive case study. Um, you can tell case studies what I know most about. Um, there, I mean, I think part of the job is just is trying to find stuff for yourself. Really, Richard Pring is very good. Philosophy of Education Research. There's also a book by Lindsay Patterson of Frank Beckhofer called the um, Research Design in Education. I think. Lindsay Patterson of Frank Beckhofer up in the School of Social and Political Sciences in the university here. I'm sure it's called the Princi Principles of Research Design in Education, something like that. It might even be in the handbook. Google Lindsay Patterson Research Methods Education. Have you got a question or are you just holding the dice? In the introduction part, um, what kind of approach should we include? Like the accountant of the article or the article? Yeah, the, yeah. So in the introduction, you're just going to say something like, in this assignment or in this paper, I am going to uh, present a critical evaluation of um, what you know, might be um, Higgins and Watchow 2013. Um, I start off by looking at the paradigmatic assumptions and how well they fit the research purpose. I follow that by looking at the confidence we can have in the knowledge generated by the research before briefly turning to look at issues around impact and ethics. Something like that. So basically, I just repeated the question. But <laughs> yeah, is that okay? You're just telling us what you're going to do. 
And you, I mean, you can, you can say, you know, in the, in the introduction, you might want to say something like, you know, I conclude that this is a very strong piece of research, which is, you know, it's very high quality and that we can have a lot of confidence in the findings. Or you could conclude and say, you could say something like, you know, throughout this essay, I argue that whilst there are some strengths to the, the approach to research that's been taken, there are some significant limitations which weaken the confidence that we can have in this study. That sort of thing, depends on what you're going to argue. Is that okay? Uh, anyone else got a question? There were some questions I got emailed. Can I mention limitations of the authors mentioned them? Yes, you can. Um, can you cite websites? But yes, but remember that first workshop where we did sources of knowledge. How much confidence can you have in them? Uh, use them wisely. Should I read beyond the core readings? Yes, if you want to get better than a C for knowledge and use of the literature. Because that's the criteria. Can I get my dice back? Don't throw it at me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else? Got time for one last question if there are any. If not, I will assume that you're all going to get A1s. And... <laughs> Grand. Okay, thanks very much, folks. Good luck.